I'm not sure what I can add to what we just heard. Um, <clears throat> this is the title that I, I, I think I assigned myself. Um, I'm going to take a look back and a look forward uh, and uh, um, uh, tell stories that will be familiar to many of you, but I thought my job here is to sort of set the tone. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, show data that I think most of you uh, have seen before and, and, are, and are familiar with, but um, in, a, uh, in a context that sort of sets forth the, what we've learned uh, and what we don't know, and, and the, the, the roadmap is, is down here. I, I, I think it is important <coughs> Uh, to emphasize that that we will never get anywhere unless we understand the underlying biology. We have to make discovery in order to implement discovery. Uh, and I think that's self-evident. I know we're here to implement, and I'm not going to dwell on the discovery part, but I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it. Now, if you ask your mother uh, whether every single person who gets a drug responds in the same way, the answer will be no. Everybody expects there to be variability in response to drugs. These are data from old data from the Pharmacogenomics Research Network. Julie will recognize this graph, maybe. It's a long, long time ago. And the notion is that it, no matter what metric of drug response you look at, there is always variability around a mean effect. Uh, what we're much more interested in uh, and what catches people's attention is the rare adverse drug events. And some of those are pictured here. And uh, for those of you who can't figure out what they are, they're, they're, uh, they're shown here. So, um, and, and just to make the point, and I think Simone will probably make it later, that there is a lot of activity across NIH looking at basic mechanisms. These are web pages from the uh, current pharmacogenomics research network. And, and this is us, and this is the Stevens-Johnson project going on at Vanderbilt, uh, supported through a P50 award. And the important project is the QT project that is highlighted here, because that's what I do. Um, adverse drug events are rare, and in the practice of an individual physician, uh, come up uh, so rarely that they may not be recognized, uh, as Mr. Anderson uh, highlighted for us. Uh, that said, they are enorm an enormous problem across the country. These are old data, venerable data. People love to, love to quote these uh, as adverse drug events being the fourth to sixth leading cause of death in hospital. Those are 1998 data. In 2010, the data were really not very different. Uh, 100,000 people a year would be the equivalent of one jumbo jet crashing and killing all the passengers aboard every single day. So this is not a small problem. This is an enormous problem. Um, in, the, in the United Kingdom, uh, Munir Mohammed and his colleagues looked at uh, hospitalizations in three years across 18,000 patients, and 6.5% of them were due to an adverse, 6.5% of admissions were due to an adverse drug reaction. These are the drugs. I don't expect you to look at the list and memorize them, but the, the estimate is that somewhere around a third of these have a, a prominent genetic component to, to risk. Uh, for those of you who uh, can't remember why drugs work and how drugs work, this is my simplified version of uh, truth. And that is, you give a dose of a drug and it's delivered to its molecular target. Lots of things happen in between. And those are the pharmacokinetic variants that people worry about. And then once it achieves, it reaches a molecular target, good and bad things happen at the whole organ and the whole organism uh, level, and that's the pharmacodynamic piece. And of course, all the genes that are responsible for transducing pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics are candidates for, variant, uh, for, for uh, variable drug effects through pharmacogenomic mechanisms. This is a venerable slide from Mary and Bill uh, in a science article in uh, the last century listing major, uh, major, major drug metabolizing pathways. I used to highlight which ones had polymorphisms in them, but I don't do that anymore because they all do. Um, and, uh, and, but I think this is the framework. That said, uh, I think this is not a, a, a terribly, uh, this is a catalog. And I think another good way of thinking about it is this concept of high-risk pharmacokinetics that, uh, that Mike Steen and I actually uh, uh, wrote about about 10 years after Mary. And I think it's a, it's a concept that's sort of self-evident to everybody in this room. And that is, there are certain situations 
in which a polymorphism in one of those drug metabolizing pathways assumes particularly clinical importance. One setting is a prodrug that is, uh, that is bioactivated by a pathway that, uh, that either uh, is absent for genetic reasons or because of uh, uh, phenocopying by administration of, a, of, a, of an inhibiting drug. Uh, the, the best example is enkinide, but that's no longer on the market. And, uh, I spent 10 years of my life with enkinide, so that's why I put it here. But I do to put it in, in smaller type. And clopidogrel, tamoxifen are like this. Codeine, of course, is a prodrug that's bioactivated through this pathway, not bioinactivated through this pathway to morphine. And, and you all know the stories around that. The other high-risk pharmacokinetic setting is where a parent drug is bioinactivated to, uh, it, through a single pathway, the same idea. That only becomes important if there's a... A, a narrow margin between efficacy and safety for these drugs. If a, dr if a drug has a very wide margin, then inhibiting the pathway doesn't have as a great of an effect. <laughs> Examples of that are, are warfarin, urinotecan, azathioprine. And the other way in which this can happen is if you have failure of uh, the excretor or organ. That's not genetic. Uh, but I'll come back to that uh, and give you a specific example of sotalol and renal failure. Don't, don't, somebody on sotalol develops renal failure they, uh, they will develop toxicity because of very elevated plasma concentrations unless the dose is reduced or the drug is stopped. <clears throat> I want to talk about warfarin. And, and I, I, I do this uh, with very mixed emotions because I think warfarin as a drug is going away. But warfarin has taught this community a lot. And I think the thing to take away is the lessons that we have learned uh, good and bad over the years. So Alan Reddy. Uh, described a paper, described warfarin metabolism, and described the fact that there was a specific high affinity pathway for warfarin metabolism in liver microsomes uh, again in the last century. That turns out to be CYP2C19. He actually described uh, the, the STAR2 polymorphism and suggested that might be a, a mechanism for variable drug actions. And again, in the last century, people noticed that there were patients who received very low doses of warfarin and had a high burden of <coughs> reduction or loss of functional alleles in CYP2C9. And interestingly, they had an in increased incidence of bleeding, an, an observation that's really interesting and I'll come back to later. My throat is better, in fact, than it's been for the last two weeks. So if you ask somebody at the beginning of the 21st century, how, what's, the, what's the pharmacogenetic story around warfarin? This is the story, S-warfarin bio, bioinactivated by CYP2C9 and their variants in CYP2C9. And the FDA was all ready to start a, a trial looking at the effect of uh, preemptive genotyping for CYP2C9. Some of you will remember that. And uh, around that time, uh, there's this paper in Nature that describes variants in vcor c one as a cause of warfarin resistance. And, uh, and it becomes clear that there's another piece to this story that involves the pharmacodynamic piece, vcor c one which is the target for warfarin action. Uh, Terry Klein and others uh, organized the, uh, uh, the International Warfarin Pharmacogenomics Consortium that put together 5,000 people and their genetic data from across the world. And there are a couple of observations that we made that were important. Number one, though a steady state warfarin dose varies by ancestry. Number two, uh, a lot of that uh, variability is attributable to changes to, to, to a common polymorphism in the promoter of vcor C1, uh, as well as to rarer variants in CYP2C9. We catalog the variants in CYP2C9 in European populations. It turns out there are others in African populations that we just didn't look at in those early days. And, uh, and then you could compare an algorithm based on pharmacogenetics, an algorithm based on uh, clinical features alone, or an algorithm that said start with five milligrams a day and go from there uh, across all the patients that we had in the, in the, uh, the consortium. And uh, you could show that adding genetics makes a difference in people who end up on high or low doses. The fact is most people end up in the middle. So this is one of the lessons that if we're going to implement pharmacogenomics, it only benefits a small, a, a, a subset of the population. These people don't need genetics. Another piece of the puzzle that I think we haven't paid as much attention to as we should is this idea that there are rare coding variants, uh, rare non-synonymous variants in the coding region of vcor C1. This is a, a really nice study looking at people who take very high doses of warfarin. Uh, and the reason they take very high doses of warfarin is basically because they're non-compliant. 
But when you start to do genetic testing in those patients, you find occasional patients who are compliant but who have variant genetics. And this is a nice example. This is D36Y. It's, uh, it's a rare variant, except if you happen to be running an anticoagulant clinic in Israel where it's quite a common variant and it accounts for high doses. So that's the story in 2008. Fast forward to 2017, you can look up in Nomad as I did last night. There are 231 non-synonymous variants in vcor C1. So each one of those is a candidate for transducing high warfarin dose requirements in a rare patient. Carol, this sounds like GM9, doesn't it? I mean, this is the, the challenge to us is now to figure out the functional genomics of each one of these. Uh, and as, of course, the warfarin lesson has been that there have been randomized trials. I'm not going to get into the details. They are very important. The details that are important are what the ancestry is, what the genotyping is, what the endpoint is. And uh, you know that the U.S. trial showed no difference when genomics were added to, uh, to a clinical algorithm. The European trial showed a difference when genomics were added to a standard uh, warfarin dosing regimen. One of the things that all those trials were underfunded, underfunded, they were underfunded and underpowered to do was look at important endpoints like bleeding. So this is the, this is the, the U.S., the COAG trial and the bleeding events. There were very few, but the trend, interestingly, is, is, is in the right direction. Uh, at Vanderbilt, we looked, uh, used our EMR to look at a very, to, to tediously uh, uh, ascertain uh, a, a large number of patients, around 500 patients with uh, bleeding events that led to admission to hospital and 500 controls. And what we found was that CYP2C9 star 3 is a predictor of that event, not a, not a, with an odds ratio of about 1.7, so not a huge effect, but, but an effect nevertheless. And uh, Dave Veenstra has very similar data, but he landed on CYP4F2, uh, and, and we, Josh Peterson and Dave are going to put the data together along with Mike Steen to figure out, uh, and many others in this room actually, to figure out what the right, uh, what the right predictor is. And then GIFT was announced uh, about uh, two months ago. Uh, I, ask, uh, I asked Brian Gage for the slides, and uh, he said he would ask the steering committee, and the steering committee is still deliberating. So this is what I know from the, uh, from the American College of Cardiology website. Uh, 1,650 patients uh, who were randomized, who are going to get warfarin randomized to a pharmacogenetic algorithm or a clinical algorithm with uh, sub-randomization sub to various INR targets. There's a composite primary endpoint, which is listed here, which I think is very important, because genetics beat beat the conventional therapy. This is the first time that uh, genetics in warfarin have actually shown this uh, big effect uh, um, in the United States. This is a largely Caucasian trial. The, the African-American alleles are not included. And, and there are sub, uh, there, I think the, it was major bleeding in the INR greater than four, but Julie may know better. I can't remember, Julie, which, which of the components of the component, composite endpoint, but you're not allowed to look at comp components anyway. So, but this is, this is coming, this is in review, and, and, and uh, I'm not sure how this will affect warfarin use, because warfarin, I think, is going away, but I think that there's an important lesson here. Um, I, I, this is a really interesting, and imp uh, there's a lesson in this study, and I think it's important to say it. So uh, azathioprine uh, and TPMT, this is a study done in, uh, largely in, in, in Europe, uh, randomizing patients with IBD who are going to get in, inflammatory bowel disease who are going to get azathioprine to uh, a conventional therapy or an intervention arm. The intervention arm uh, requires genotyping if you have if you're uh, if you're intermediate or if you're uh, homozygous null the doses are reduced or reduced drastically and uh, and then followed so one question is when you reduce the dose of azathioprine do you actually change the outcome in inflammatory bowel disease and they have lots and lots and lots of metrics in this study that show that there's no difference in the disease course when they adjust the dose. What's interesting is when they look at the percentage of patients with hematologic adverse drug events there's no difference whether you, whether you uh, use genetic guided therapy or not. So you'd say, okay, uh, I don't understand why that is, but there is no difference. But when you then look, not across all the patients, but only the ones with the TPMT variants, then there's an enormous difference. Then the number of people who get adverse hematologic effects is very, very small, almost zero in the, in the intervention arm and about 22% uh, in the conventional arm. So, 
this again highlights the idea that if we're going to do pharmacogenetics in this way, the benefits are there, but the benefits are there in the people who have the variants, and that may be a small subset. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this. It's a, prevent, it's a terrible adverse drug reaction. It's terrible and predictable. Simon Malal and Elizabeth Phillips showed uh, over 10 years ago that uh, there is this huge odds ratio for a back of your related SJS, and you know that there's a trial called PREDICT uh, that, uh, that looked at uh, uh, a genetically guided therapy versus uh, conventional therapy. You're kidding. Conventional therapy uh, in, uh, uh, in the initiation of abacavir, and basically you could get rid of all abacavir-related skin rash, which is this line down here, by doing genetic testing, and this has become part of therapy. Uh, the same story holds true for carbamazepine and uh, HLA, uh, 15, so HLA-B1502. Uh, this is the study in Nature that described that in 2004. And uh, uh, 1502 is interesting because it's uh, highly prevalent in Southeast Asia uh, and not so prevalent across the world. There are other alleles that are prevalent in other parts of the world that transduce carbamazepine-induced uh, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, but it, again, it depends on where you are and who you are. Uh, there is this interesting Hong Kong carbamazepine experience. They saw the data. They uh, put in a policy that you had to do genetic testing. So what happens when you do that? Uh, new prescriptions for carbamazepine just fall. People just don't do the genetic testing. Instead, what they do, and the, and the incidence of carbamazepine-induced SJS falls. Instead, what they do is they increase the use of phenytoin, a drug that also has SJS associated with it, although we don't know exactly what the, what the right mechanism is for that drug. So the total number of uh, uh, SJS cases stays stable. And the moral is not to, that you don't do genetic testing. The moral is you have to do genetic testing and an educational program and tell people what to do with the results, not just sort of say, don't use carbamazepine, because it's a pain in the rear, so people stop. So um, I can't talk about implementing without showing this slide. I, I've been showing this slide for probably uh, 17 years now. And, uh, and I think uh, it says a lot about the expectations of the public when, when we see cartoons like this in The New Yorker. Uh, and this is what Francis Collins said when he became director of NIH about pharmacogenetics. And you've, many of you have seen this slide before. Basically, for what Francis says is if everyone's DNA sequence is already in the medical record, it's simply a click of the mouse to find out all the information. So we all, I think many of us in this room have drunk this Kool-Aid and agree with this. But it's not simple, uh, as we're, and that's the reason we're here. And it's probably not as inexpensive as Francis thought it was going to be. So I told you I'd say something about Sotolol. Uh, this is an 82-year-old man on Sotolol for atrial fibrillation, develops renal failure, and no dose adjustment is made. And he develops this really interesting uh, long QT-related polymorphic tachycardia due to Sotolol toxicity. And uh, if you look at the label for Sotolol, it says uh, adjust the dose uh, when uh, renal failure occurs. And you would be an idiot if you were a practitioner and didn't follow that advice, because th what, you, what would happen is what was shown on the previous slide. Is, is, is there, are, are there data that actually support that? that? The, the answer is no. But this is what, the way we practice medicine. So is this a case of genetic exceptionalism or a case of Sotolol exceptionalism? I don't know, but I think that we have to sort of think about what kind of evidence do we want, do we need to have before we implement, and that's one of the reasons we're here. Um, Clopidogrel was approved in 1998, was known to be a prodrug. The bioactivation pathway was not defined, but it was approved anyway. Uh, in 2006, the pathway was defined, and what was interesting about this study is a small CRC-related study, and they studied heterozygotes for the loss of function allele CYP2C9 star 2. And what they show is that this is platelet function on the y-axis. At baseline, it may, there's no genotype effect on platelet function. Uh, after a week of clopidogrel, you have reduced platelet function in people with a wild-type allele, but with tremendous variability across the population, across this small C CRC population. And in the star twos, there's, there is a small effect. Uh, there's no effect on average, but there's an effect in some people. 
That translates into retrospective looks at a difference in the incidence of clopidogrel-related events. If you carry a variant, you have less, less good clopidogrel outcomes with higher incidences of uh, adverse events compared to if you don't carry the common alleles. We don't know anything about the rare alleles. At Vanderbilt, we have the PREDICT program, and the PREDICT program has been genotyping. It's genotyped about 15,000 people, and what we find is that 2% of our population are homozygotes, so those are high risk for not responding to clopidogrel. About 20% are uh, heterozygotes, high risk for not responding to ordinary doses, may need higher doses. So if you're a cardiologist, you're looking at a difference between 12 and 8%. You're going to genotype a lot of people to chase down a little bit of an event, and you sort of say to yourself, why do I, why, why do I bother to do this? If you're a geneticist, you say, well, you're ge doing it to chase this group here and perhaps some of this group here. Sarah Van Dries in our group looked at uh, uh, five drug gene pairs. Clopidogrel is one. There's a group at high risk, a group at moderate risk. And for each of the drug gene pairs, we define a group at high risk and moderate risk. The important point is that 5% of the population is at high risk for something. And these are data that have been repeated worldwide. And 91% in our hands, just for five drug gene pairs, are, uh, are at high risk or at moderate risk for something. You just don't know what the drug is, and you don't know uh, uh, whether they're going to get that drug. So that's the argument for the idea of large preemptive pharmacogenetics, not across a single drug, but across large numbers of drugs. And uh, we're doing that in PREDICT. Uh, Mary's doing that at St. Jude. There's a program at Mayo. There are others in this room, I'm sure, and I apologize that I haven't included them. We did that as part of the Emerge PGX uh, project that Laura will talk about. And there's a large project in Europe, the UPGX project that, uh, that is also doing that. And uh, there's in interesting design challenges in those studies. So this is my last slide. So what do we need? We need to not lose sight of the fact that we don't know everything there is th to know about what we might want to implement. And we have to stay grounded in the basic biology and the basic uh, science of variable drug actions. We do need methods to identify, accumulate, and study those outliers. So I'm fond of saying if you want to study uh, you know, a, a group of people where an event occurs 0.001% of the time, you have to start with a very, very large denominator. So that's the argument for doing these kinds of things within Emerge or within uh, the All of Us cohort or within other very, very large cohorts. Uh, to capture the small number of outliers that become interesting. And whether that's through, through pr passive methods or through active methods, like the kinds of networks that Elizabeth Phillips is trying to put together, uh, remains to be think seen. I don't think there's one answer. I think there are many answers. We need good genetic tests. CYP2D6 is not easy. Uh, there are people in this room who know a lot about that, and it's not a simple test. And we, need, we will need functional genomics, because there are tons and tons of variants that remain to be defined. Uh, I had this thing that we need uh, 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 guidelines on how to use drugs, but I put that in sort of gray letters just to, to acknowledge the fact that Mary and others in CPIC have done an enormous amount of work to try to actually answer the question, what would you do with a result once you got it? And that is the go-to place right now. And I think that, so that's, that's still a need. I'm not trying to take Mary's funding away, God knows. Uh, but, but I think it is, it is, um, it is a, step, a big step in the right direction. Um, we will need IT infrastructure to do this right. We'll need uh, data on what works and what doesn't work, whether it's panel testing or preemptive testing. I, I'm an advocate of preemptive testing if it can be done. We obviously need education. We need data on outcomes. There are people in this room who, will, who are desperate for outcomes data because if they don't have outcomes data, it's hard to go to their uh, stockholders and uh, stakeholders and say that we want to support this. And there are lots and lots of partners. We, there are patients that are partners. There are payers that are partners. There are users that are partners. And this is a worldwide effort. This is not something that is going to happen only in the United States for all the reasons that, that, I've, that I've talked about. So I, I hope that sort of sets the tone for what we will talk about. I hope that's what you wanted to hear about. And uh, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, yeah, I think we do have a few minutes for questions. You ended, you ended early, which is uh, No, I ended, I ended on time. I ended on time. Uh, you ended I, on I, got time. These, I got these numbers being flashed in front uh, yes, of me. And yeah. I, uh, well, thank you for, for doing so. Questions for Dan? OK. Howard. 
Dan, I wonder if you could comment on the technology, um, you know, thinking back to Angela Anderson, and, and the, uh, obviously that's a very complex case, but the turnaround time for results, even if that hospital or that <laughs> clinic, the, that um, doc in the box, uh, I can't remember the name of the one you went to, but um, had the technology, it might have been two weeks before the results came back yep. uh, to say what her HLA uh, status was in order to, to make a decision. What, where are things going in terms of trying to change that? Because that, that's holding things up um, as much or more than some of the other aspects. I have my biases, and, and, I, and, I, and I wish I had included this slide. Josh has seen this slide, and, and a, a couple of you have, but not many. Um, I used to show, so, so one idea is the woman has her, has her genetic information. Uh, so first of all, the answer to the question is, uh, you have to have your genetic data done beforehand, and you have to have it accessible. So is that on a piece of paper that a woman hands to the pharmacist? No. Uh, is it on a smart card? I used to go around talking about this stuff, and I'd have something called the international gene card, and I have a picture of myself with a little dot of DNA, and I, and I think that, would, that was very cool. But I think the way it will work is that you'll have a QR code on your phone and you'll have a reader in the pharmacy or in any podunk hospital in the country or in the world. You put the QR code under that. It accesses a website that's secure and it says, oh, by the way, this person has X. And it's been, but it's, it, it's only if it's been done beforehand, done, validated, high quality data, stored against the day that it needs to be used. So I think that some way of sticking stuff, you know, for lack of a better term, in the cloud and, and having it accessible uh, on the fly uh, to healthcare systems, big or small, rural or urban, uh, is, is the way that it, it may play out. And, and I'd be interested, I mean, I, I'm not married to that concept, but I think that that's something like that is the way it's going to work. Uh, to do, you know, to do proper HLA typing, to do proper CYP2D6 typing, uh, you know, I, I know there are people, uh, uh, some of them in this room who have who have experience with you know whole genome uh, uh, sequencing in in neonates, but whether they do whole genome sequencing in neonates that includes CYP2D6, which is a you know a tough a tough nut to crack or HLA, it's awkward that the two the two genes we're most interested in are the ones that are among the hardest to sort of annotate properly in the genome. So I, I think that has to be done. For, Preemptively, uh, and, and I, I look forward to the day that you know people will have DNA sequence and uh, uh, and um, and be have it accessible with the proper uh, point of care decision support. Rex, oh sorry, where was I? Somebody said yes. question over here. Good morning, okay. Dr. Melissa Clark. I was curious in your um, predict trial and the predict preemptive uh, pharmacogenomics. Um, how are you accounting uh, for in your design the ability to translate any positive results that you have to community-based physicians, um, given that, you know, there's that large learning curve and the need for education that you mentioned before? So um, I I'm not the right person to answer that question. I will let either Josh, Danny, or Michael over there answer that question because their Ignite, our Ignite project is trying to do exactly that, uh, that uh, trying to sort of crack that nut. And I don't think it's a simple nut to crack, no offense, Michael. Uh, so one of you should answer that question. <laughs> well, you know, I, think, I think we, it's probably early for us to really answer that question. Although, you know, I think we can point to um, other efforts that, that you can look at, national efforts, for instance, to, uh, in, in southeastern uh, Asia countries that have looked at um, uh, screening for SGS TEN, and, and efforts there have you know shown differences with what's happened, um, and uh, by sort of national <coughs> awareness campaigns, um, I think um, in our efforts uh, we saw differences. Vanderbilt's not a community hospital, but it is interesting that without a lot of effort <coughs> around. Um, education to providers, people do sort of seamlessly follow what the decision support uh, recommends and alter their prescribing based on, you know, our advice um, and predict. And, and, then, and then community experiments are ongoing. Okay, so that would be clinical decision support integrated into their, their EMR. So, so we do want to leave some time after Simona's presentation for questions, so maybe we'll do one more from, from Rex and then we'll go on. So this may be not something you can answer in a short 
uh, answer, but you know, obviously the medical outcomes of even saving one life is really significant, but to think about the economic outcomes, if we actually calculated the elimination of SJS cases, we calculated the known cases that we have, do we have any estimates of what the economic benefit to the healthcare system might be? I'm not, I'm not aware of that. There may be others in this room who, who, who are. The, um, but I think it's an important calculus because putting, putting in place a large program like PREDICT or like UPGX or like Mary's program at St. Jude is not cheap. But when you start to think about uh, it, the calculus of human life is that's diffi difficult, but when you start to think about the costs of taking care of critically ill patients for days and days or weeks and weeks, that's also incredibly not cheap. And so the calculus is in there somewhere. Maybe John Wilson at Optum can figure that out for us, John. But I uh, will hear from you later, I'm sure. But but that's the yeah, Mark uh, gonna... and, and Mark and Mark has an answer. Right, I always have an answer. Um, so the, no comment. So the, so the answer is, is that there is, hasn't been a comprehensive economic look at this at present, but there have been a number of uh, cost effectiveness analyses that have been done on individual drug gene uh, pair. So uh, for the back of ear, for um, carbamazepine, for uh, warfarin, uh, uh, clopidogrel, et cetera, we have those. Now my understanding is that Josh Peterson at Vanderbilt um, is actually um, working on a comprehensive pharmacogenetic uh, economic model uh, to try and get an answer to the question that you're doing. And, uh, uh, but to my knowledge, that is not, um, the results from that are not quite yet available, but uh, it is being worked on because I so, think that so, is an important question. So Mark, I, you know, I, I had a conversation with Josh about five years, Josh Peterson about five years ago, and I said, you know, it ought to be possible to build a Markov model and you attach every, to every, to every transition, you attach a probability and then a cost, and then you stick it in an Excel spreadsheet, and you just push a button and say, well, if the costs are this, then the outcome is that. And, and, I, and I, I said, you know, it feels like an afternoon's worth of work, Josh. And um, five years later, and uh, one very large NHLBI grant later, uh, it, it coming soon. Uh, okay. But I think that's an important point. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Dan. And, and we may have a few minutes after, uh, afterward before the break for um, uh, further discussion. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Simona Volpe, who will be uh, uh, reviewing NIH-supported PGX research to sort of help us identify what gaps there are and where we need to go.